Welcome again to Global Science at Korea Business News. Today, we're going to have a fascinating talk with Professor Mark Schmidt, eminent biologist at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. Dr. Schmidt, welcome to our show. Uh, thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, the corona situation seems to be getting worse as parts of the United States begin to resume opening its economy. What is the current situation like in Pennsylvania? Some states, if you look at the pandemic, uh, the numbers are actually going down. For example, New York and New Jersey, uh, they're going down. And then other states like Pennsylvania and Texas, they're actually going up. Uh, in Pennsylvania, um, I looked up the numbers and uh, Pennsylvania itself has about close to 13 million people and we have um, 77,000 cases and about 6,000 deaths. I live in Philadelphia. Um, it's actually the sixth largest city in the U.S. It has about 6 million people in the metro area. It's about twice the size of your second largest city, Busan, for example. Um, and we have here about 17,000 cases um, and a total of 1,700 deaths. Uh, right now, Pennsylvania is actually doing reasonably well. Um, and there's, there's a, a, slowly de a slow decrease in cases. Um, one thing to think about Pennsylvania as a state, it, it's quite a large state. As I said, there are 13 million people. And uh, our governor, Governor Wolf, who's a Democrat, Democratic governor, has put in several phases, um, a red phase, yellow phase, and green phase. And most of the state is now in the yellow phase, which means that there's a slow reopening. Well, that's positive news. Now, Dr. Schmidt, as the coronavirus continues to mutate, other new viruses will appear. Is there a way for humanity to respond to these viruses when they enter the human population? Um, so this is a difficult question to ask. And um, no, it's not a difficult question to ask. It's a difficult question to answer. Um, of course, there's a huge diversity of viruses. And there are many viruses that we don't really understand yet or don't even know about. Um, and, you know, throughout our planet, there are many different types of ecosystems, and many of them are very stable, and that stability has evolved over millions of years. So we have many animals that are dealing or coping with certain viruses, and they've evolved an immune response to fight those viruses, and so they're in a stable equilibrium. So once you start messing up with um, these different ecosystems and climate change is going to be one that's going to eventually mess a number of ecosystems up and uh, human actions like deforestation will cause an imbalance in these systems. Now what you have is you have a contact between these animals and the viruses that infect them and the human population. And this is what we've seen with, with COVID and we've seen this in the past with SARS. And so this is something we have to be very careful and very aware of. And there are large areas, you know, Amazon forest, large unin uh, uninhabited areas, uh, including Antarctica, which is sort of, you know, with 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 uh, with warming, the ice is the ice is going to melt, and he's going to start um, uncovering probably organisms that might have certain viruses. And so we have to be aware of that. Um, so what do we do when it enters the population? Well, I think we need to be prepared. And if I look at how our our country responded, as we I think we're taken by surprise. Uh, we underestimated the danger of the virus. Um, and we had a number of different um, committees in place. We had, for example, the Global Health Security and Biodefense Unit in place uh, that was part of the National Security Council. It was set up in 2015 by Barack Obama. That was dismantled in uh, 2018, I believe. And so those were, org those were sort of committees that, that whose role was to really look out and, and be prepared. Um, so we got caught, um, you know, flat-footed. We didn't respond quickly. Um, and so we did a very bad job. And I think in the future, countries and, and you know, the planet is going to have to really take these pandemics seriously. Um, if I look at Asia, you know, Asia had a major outbreak in 2002, 2004 for SARS. And so the Asian countries, I think, in general, were were took, took this very seriously. And so when COVID came, they, they knew how to respond. Um, they had protocols in place, they had strategies. And, you know, a lot of Americans really looked up to countries like South Korea and Germany uh, because they had a huge amount of discipline, the way they approached the pandemic, they took it very seriously. 
and a lot of people in their governments understood science. Well, that's positive news. How has the local economy been impacted by both the viral outbreak and now the protest? Well, so the pandemic followed by the protest was definitely a one-two punch uh, for the local economies. A lot of the underprivileged uh, population was hit much harder uh, than you know people with wealth who could you know stay at home in the suburbs uh, and they were still paid. They could work on Zoom. Um, you know the local local economies got hit hard, and so you know you have merchants whose storefronts might have been broken, which happened in many cities, including uh, Philadelphia and the areas around my university. Um, but I want to emphasize, though, that that you know the protests. There's I don't have time to talk about the protests, obviously, but but there's a reason why they happened, and I think there's a huge disparity in our society, and um, I think that was became so apparent with the pandemic, and they've become peaceful now. Um, but there is a reckoning in our society about just the racism that is so clearly there. Um, and it's been there for many, many, many decades. And we are hopefully going to see a change. Well, let's hope things improve, Dr. Schmidt. Now, when news articles appeared which showed that Donald Trump's approval ratings have fallen, President Trump responded that they were all fake news. Now, he may have been shaken by this and then stated that he may start his re-election campaign. As an American, how do you view Donald Trump's possible re-election? And what are the views of other Americans regarding his re-election possibility? Personally, I mean, this is a personal view, obviously. I, I feel that uh, President Trump has been extremely shaken by the pandemic and by the racial protests. It's put him on very unfamiliar footing. And he is finding himself completely out of his comfort zone. Um, he came with an, one agenda in mind, which was to turn around the economy. You know, he thought of himself as a great deal maker, and he's going to turn this around. Um, I think that he just does not have the understanding of what the pandemic is about. Um, he is not trained in the sciences. Um, he's probably a smart guy. Um, but he's certainly not taking the time to really understand what the pandemic is about. Um, and so he's really not been able to show great leadership. Um, certainly as a citizen, I've been looking, you know, uh, from the federal government for some guidance. And I think all of us are finding that there is no leadership. I see. Now, Professor Schmidt, how are elite universities like your university, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and other universities preparing now for a possible second viral outbreak once classes resume in the fall? So I have to say that I have been very impressed with my university, and this is probably true for many other universities. Um, in terms of the preparation for the initial outbreak, um, you know, I was on several committees uh, with the dean's offices where we were having preparatory talks to to figure out after spring break what are we going to do the university has put a lot of thought in trying to figure that out it's these are very very difficult questions um, so so I've been impressed on that front um, we don't know yet what we're going to do next semester I think that they're waiting until July 1st to make make a decision right now the sense is that all large classes will be taught online uh, and smaller classes, less than 20, will be taught in person with social distancing. Um, but we don't know yet. And it is worth asking the question, how do students and parents feel? Am I willing to pay such a high tuition to have my son or daughter attend classes from home in their bedroom uh, virtually? So it turns out that teaching virtual classes is very time consuming. And we have to try to come up with very creative ways of making it worth the student's time. So I think in the end, we're going to have to do a lot more one-on-one -on -one contact with students through small Zoom breakout rooms where we have uh, sort of intense discussions. I see. Well, let's hope for the best. Now, because of the coronavirus, there's an increase of unemployed workers. Is there any data for UPenn students' employment rate? And how drastically has the employment situation changed before and after the virus? So. I actually don't know the numbers for the University of Pennsylvania. I looked them up for Pennsylvania 
itself. Um, Pennsylvania has, as I said, about 13 million people. So it has a workforce of about 6 million. Right now, there are 2 million plus that are unemployed in Pennsylvania. Again, this is probably temporary, but it's a third of the workforce. And clearly, people from um, low income um, demographic are being particularly hard, hit very hard. And again, the pandemic really is clearly showing the disparities in our society. Um, at our university, certainly when the pandemic started, we tried, um, the university tried, and I think there were a number of petitions circling to make sure that we keep the employees at the university who might have been fired. Um, these were employees that were working, let's say, for the dining services, which is private companies, but that work within the umbrella of the university. So the university decided to step in and actually um, keep them on. Um, and what they've also done for students, especially students of need, is that the university has kept their work study jobs, even though they were not able to come back to the university. I have a number of students in my laboratory, for example, who received stipends for the summer. They are at home, but the university is still going ahead and paying these stipends, um, even though most of the work is actually not physically in the laboratory, but actually at home working on Zoom. Understood. Now, Dr. Schmidt, with the outbreak of the coronavirus, is there another scientific area that you're interested in? And also, I know that it's outside your field of ex expertise, but what kind of impact will this have on the global economy? Obviously, as a scientist, I'm, I'm interested in many different areas of, scient of science, and, and I, I, I look with awe at, at, at the, the speed at which the science is progressing um, on every possible different aspect of COVID, from you know, engineering labs to labs in medicine to labs in basic genetics, trying to come together to try to find some way of figuring out what the virus is about, coming up with vaccines, coming up with treatments. Um, at our university, as you might know, um, we've been completely shut down since March 1st, except for labs willing to work on COVID. And so a lot of labs at my university have retooled to actually work towards COVID. Uh, and again, from a range from engineering all the way through medicine. The one thing that's been remarkable in looking at this is that science, and there have been articles out there saying that this might actually change the way science is done, is that, is that it, it's become um, a worldly discipline uh, with a lot of collaborations across continents. Um, and also it has led to rapid publication. So basically transparency and rapid sharing of information, which, you know, Chinese scientists will publish something and you'll have the data, then labs in the US can actually um, read that data almost immediately and actually start designing their experiments based on that. Are there any stocks or sectors that you would like to share with our viewers today? Um, there's a company in New York called Regeneron um, that I've been very impressed with for a long, long time. And so they just recently are doing clinical trial, trials for an antibody treatment. And so I've always been impressed with, with what they've done. So I think they're probably worth looking into in terms of, uh, of their stock and they are traded. Um, and then there are a number of companies obviously that are pushing for vaccine production. It's gonna be hard to know which one is going to be uh, the one that's most successful. There probably are gonna be many different uh, companies that are successful. And so sometimes you have to look for the companies that have a really good track record. And so, for example, SK Biopharmaceuticals, a Korean company, has an outstanding track record. And so I think to put your money on companies like that is really probably a pretty good and safe bet. Professor Mark Schmidt of the University of Pennsylvania, thank you again for taking time to share your views with us today on Korea Business News. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Professor Mark Schmidt recommends two stocks, Regeneron, which is related to antibody tests and is listed in the United States, and a Korean company called SK Biopharmaceuticals, which will go public later this summer. I want to thank everyone again for joining us on Korea Business News Global Sign. We look forward to seeing everyone again very soon. Thank you very much.